Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's be seated. Hallelujah. We give God praise. We give God praise. I mean, there is nothing more glorious and beautiful than for humans to exist on earth and give God what he wants. It's such a beautiful thing that we can live accurate here in time. In the midst of the rottenness, in the midst of all of the things that are happening, in the midst of failing standards, it's a privilege. It's glorious. And I want to say to us, to encourage us, do not pick your cues from what is prevailing around you. Do not pick your cues from the world. And do not ever think you are the only one that is standing. God has a remnant all over the world. He has a remnant all over the world. It may not be a popular thing around you right now to serve God's purpose and be committed to the things of God. You may not find yourself in an environment where all your friends and the people that are close to you are burning for God, living rightly, pursuing righteousness, purity, and holiness. It may not be popular, but I want you to know that you have comrades, you have compatriots, you have fellow kingdom brothers and sisters in different parts of the world. Hallelujah. When Elijah was lamenting and thinking he was the only one that was left, God told him, oh, do not kid yourself. I have 7,000 others that are in reserve that have not compromised their position. And the thing is this, one of the things that that taught me is that you can never put God in a corner. It doesn't matter the millions of people that are rebelling against God. It doesn't matter the billions of people that are rebelling against God. You will always find a remnant. It may be in a remote village. It may be in one corner of the earth that nobody is aware of. But you will always find a people in the earth that are serving God's purpose, upholding his living rightly, living accurately, pursuing him with all of their hearts. You will always find them in the earth. That's why I always say this. If I drop this mic today and abandon this path, many more people will walk this path. It's only whether or not I will be a part of them. You can't put God in a corner. You can't put God in a state and say, God, no, nobody, you know. No, he's God. Just when you think that's of a weird, he has. He has them. He has people he has marked. That doesn't matter what happens. They will live for him. They will live for him. And so for us, let's be encouraged always. Hallelujah. And so we'll continue today what we started on Sunday, prophetic destiny of the last day church. And that is basically speaking about our prophetic destiny. Our prophetic destiny. What we have been ordained for as a people. And I started by taking us through what I call learning outcomes. And I'm just going to, again, rehearse these learning outcomes for us. The first one is to deepen our understanding of our assignment here on earth. God wants to use this opportunity to deepen our understanding of why we are still here. Because a lot of people have completely forgotten why they were sent here. A lot of believers right now think they are here just to live the good life. There's no good life in time. There's no good life in time. And so what God, one of the things God wants to do is to make sure that our understanding of why we are here is further clarified to us. Secondly, to possess a clear picture of our final destination. For us to have a clear picture of where we are headed. Because like I said on Sunday, if you lose sight of your destination, then any path becomes the right path. If you lose sight of your final destination, any path becomes the right path. Thirdly, to be firmly established on the path of truth and eternal life. And the reason why this is important is because a lot of people are walking away from the path of truth and eternity. A lot of people are walking off the path of truth and eternal life. And so God wants to use this time out to establish us firmly on the path of truth and eternal life. So that it doesn't matter where God takes you to physically, you will still be established. If you, if you are to find yourself in a remote island or a desert tomorrow, irrespective of the conditions and the circumstances, you will continue to stand for him. But for us to be able to do that, we need to be firmly established. Firmly established. Fourthly, to remain unshaken in the face of adversity and crisis of the last days. 
There are a lot of people that are seen that are still standing today. They are standing because there are certain kinds of storms and waves that they have not experienced yet. So, but what God wants to do is to build us and fortify us so that it doesn't matter the waves and the storms of life that will come our way. We will remain unshaken. And then to avoid being carried about by every wind of doctrine. Number six, to keep us burning for God like the disciples to the end of time. And number seven, to pull down grace for all that God is said to do that we have read out. And of course, we read from the book of John and I encouraged us to read up. And we said on Sunday that the 12th, apart from Judas Iscariot, remained steadfast to the end. They did not abandon the path even when faced with challenges because the disciples went through a lot of difficulties. They went through a lot of difficulties, but they did not abandon the path. And I said when John was banished to the island of Patmos where he received one of the greatest revelations in human history, it was in the middle of his tribulation. These people were so, they were so sold out and so established firmly in God that in the middle of their tribulation, they catch revelation. Some of them, like some of the hymns that we have been singing, they were written in the midst of thick tribulations and trials. Some of these people got their greatest revelation of God at the moment or at the point of their departure from time. But today, when you are not fully established in God, when little temptation or trial comes, you begin to doubt God. Today, because believers are not being built when they are confronted with, with little challenges. They abandon the path. They seek alternate solutions. They go for quick fixes. They stop trusting God. Then the enemy will come and buffet them with lies that this God that you are serving does not pay. And a lot of people have been seduced off the path because of this. But the disciples, in the midst of their greatest trials, they stood for God. And that is where God is bringing us to. And what God wants to accomplish in our lives in this season. Because we have not seen storms yet. There will still be storms. Storms are coming to the earth. God is going to shake the heavens and shake the earth. At that point, it is the quality of our built life. And what we've been established in that will keep us standing. All I mean standing is not physical, being alive physically. I mean standing spiritually. That's why Jesus Christ said, when the Son of Man comes to the earth, will he find faith? And any time, you know, there's a question like that, it is time to what to ponder. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in the earth? And that was in the context that in the end of time, there will be crisis. But will there still be a people that will say, no, I remain on this path. It doesn't matter the difficulty that this path comes with. I remain on this path. It may not be popular, I remain on this path. You live in an environment where it is not popular to do the right thing, where it's not popular to speak the truth. Where even the system wants to squeeze you. When you tell yourself, if I don't cheat the system, the system does not care about me. Will you still stand? When everything around you is giving you, is telling you, you, you must bend small. You, must, you better bend small. You will not survive. Will you still stand? Because sometimes it's easy to look at the disciples and look at what they pass through and sometimes feel like, oh, no, no. When I find myself in that situation, I will stand. But if you check your daily life, your daily living. You are cheating the system. I have people in my estate. <laughs> they go to church all the time. Every Sunday. Neatly dressed. And yet these are the same people that will remove AC from their meter. Remove AC from their meter. Remove certain things from their meter. We thought it was only our leaders that ran down Nepal. And all the other entities. If we check ourselves, we would see the contributions we made as citizens. And yet on Sunday, we'll clean up, bath up, carry our bags. Is that no that's no temptation yet to? This one is just that I supply you light, pay and use. They have not put a gun to your head to deny Jesus. It's not that you were preaching, they catch you and put you in prison. If you can't, as a believer, just pay for what you use. When they tell you not to preach, you won't preach. Because when we talk about temptation, people think, oh, when I get there. No. On a daily basis, right now, where there is no heat under you, just do the right thing. You can't do. As a believer. And you want to stand. And they will tell you that you will go to prison if you, if you, don't, if you don't deny it. I mean, you can imagine what would happen. So what I'm saying is that storms have not even come. Just living right, doing right by your brother, doing right by your sister, the people you are doing business with. You can't. 
And then on Sunday, you will clean up and carry Bible. Nah. How, how, how will you stand the storms of the last days? How? When the real persecution comes. This is what we are talking about. This is what God is preparing us for. This is what God is preparing us for. And so you, you can't be here and you're comfortable living like that. You can't be here and you're comfortable cheating your brother, cheating yourself. You can't be here and you're comfortable bypassing your meters. No, 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 no. And yet these same people will abuse Buhari. These same people will curse their leaders. And in their own little corners, they are living worse. And worse still, they are believers. These people, for what they believed in, they were tortured. Now, nobody has even come knocking to say we can't gather. Not to talk and say, okay, who will come and stand? Who will go to prison for the sake of the gospel? That is not what we have not experiencing yet. It is just that you bought something from me. You pay me. Some believers can't do that. They'll find everybody's looking for ways to cheat the next person. So what happens when the real temptation comes? So what God is doing right now is that he wants us to be firmly established on the path of truth and eternal life. On the path of truth and eternal life. Naira is doing. Inflation is on the rise. Well, believing God for respite. Do you know what's going to happen right now? Desperation will go up. People will become more desperate right now. People will begin to take extremes and decisions to survive. And God said to me, said, Fred, you know I've been preparing the church for the past 30 years for this season. You can't, we can't tell that God did not prepare us for this season. He has been preparing the church for the past 30 years. A time is coming. A time is coming. A time is coming. Crisis. Darkness will cover the earth. And even right now, when the pointers are very clear, these are the beginning of sorrows, just as Jesus Christ said in the, in the book of Matthew chapter 24. People will still not listen. And the way the disciples lived, they lived as though the kingdom that was promised was coming tomorrow. When you read the Acts, right? Acts of the Apostles, the Epistles, right? How those guys, they lived as though the second coming was going to be their day. The sense of urgency. The sense of urgency. I mean, the way they lived, they lived. I mean, when Paul, I mean, even the Holy Spirit had to even restrict Paul from going to some certain places. I mean, he was so driven. I was just traveling and just, and he was like, no, no, just chill. Don't go here. Stay on this path. They lived as though the promised kingdom was going to be delivered the next day. But God had us in mind. Hallelujah. God had us in mind. And that was why Paul, when he was writing in 2 Thessalonians 2 from verse 1, he said, Now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. As though the day of Christ had come. And then he said, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. In other words, one of the things that will characterize the last days ahead of the return of Jesus Christ is the falling away. That's why God wants us to be established. Because those who are not established will give up on this path. People, I mean, for different economic reasons, survivor, preservation, different reasons, and it's going to be valid. Why they should compromise? Why they should shift their values? Why they should step it down? This God thing is not that serious. And I told us what I saw on the trip. People are becoming flat. People are becoming enslaved to the system. Because the system demands that the more hours you give it, the more you are taken care of. People no longer depend on God for their sustenance. Because I know if I put in one extra hour, I will get that 50, ex 50 pounds extra. People are becoming enslaved to the system. And in the process, they are not aware that they are falling away. They are falling away. So there's going to be falling away. There is nothing that will happen in time that will surprise God. As a matter of fact, nothing should happen in time that should surprise us by the reason of the word of God. The, the word is there. No, no man can't surprise God. He is the alpha and the omega. That's why if you read through the scripture, you will see the timetable of the earth. Everything has been planned. Everything has been prophesied about. Everything is happening. And everything will happen as it has been told or foretold. So I'm saying this to say that we need to be established because there's still going to be what? The falling away. And it's already happening right now. 
I know that way before now, I've been meeting believers who are no longer believers. I've been meeting people who have become agnostics. I've been meeting people who have become atheists. And these were like former choir members. These were like, I mean, people that grew up on campus and they were active in fellowship and they, you know, and all of that. But right now, they are smart, they are intelligent, they are beginning to doubt that you can't prove that this, your God, is the God. And that one is just the introduction. There's going to be another falling away. It's going to continue. Because there will be people that will still abandon the path because of difficulties and challenges. They won't be able to trust God again. That's why God is calling on us to be established. Be established. Be established. Be established. So we're in a season when people will, will be driven by the extremes of life. People will begin to respond to the extremes of life. They'll be driven by the extremes of life. Extremes such as comfort. Too much comfort. Because it's not just about hardship. Too much comfort will also derail some people. Convenience. People will relax. That's why you will see people will be on fire for God in Nigeria. The moment they go to Europe or the Americas or anywhere there where the system works, where everything is comfortable, they do what? They relax. The fire that they carry here dies. And that is why I keep saying it, that the reason why we carry the fire is because of the hardship of the environment. The moment you don't think you need that fire, I mean, the system works. You don't need to pray to have electricity. You don't need to pray for the, for the, for, you know, for, for the tap to run. You, don't need, you understand what I'm saying? The system works. It's very predictable. What then happens? The fire. Vroom. People just become flat. God becomes what they attend to when there is time. Because Babylon, the system, that is running, that is the operating system that is running the world, is what has swallowed them up. They are now slaves to Babylon. What happens is that the enemy then recruits them to keep the engine of Babylon running. And you are toiling. You don't know you are already enslaved to the engine that is keeping the system running. And then the God part of you, everything just dies down. That's why the Bible says in the last days that the love of what? We grow cold. That love there is not emotional love. God is love, right? In other words, the God dimension in them will do what? They become, ens- they become slaves to the Babylonian operating system that is, you know, the engine that is making that system work. The fire goes down. But you need to be established. When you establish on this part of truth and eternity, you will, because, do you know, let me tell you guys this. You see what is happening right now where people go to certain places and then they lose focus and all of that? It's the same thing as Nebuchadnezzar setting up a system and saying everybody must bow to this system. People, a lot of Christians, people who have traveled, they don't know that they, they are like those people who are worshipping the golden calf. Because the system is arranged in such a way that it has no room for God. It will not give you time for God. As a matter of fact, no time for prayer. No time for family altar. Because the system demands that you are always given to it. So it's like worship of Baal. Or worship of the golden calf. And people, a lot of people don't know that they've abandoned their God. And they are worshiping the system. That's what a lot of people are doing. But they have no idea. People can't connect with one another anymore. People can't care. People can't give. People can't check up on the... You understand what I'm saying? Because the system demands that time. You need that time. You need to be at work. That, that hour, that clock, you need to be... What's up in the system? You have to be established. And this is not only for those who God will be releasing into different parts of the world, but even those of us who are here. When God looks down and looks at you in Nigeria and looks at your commitment, let him see that you are not professing love for him because he can have your needs met. Because he knows. That's why Jesus Christ turned John 6 and said, I know why you guys are following me. It's because of the bread and the fish. It's because of what you can get from me. It's because of your needs that you want met. And he said, if you don't drink my blood, eat my flesh, you have no part in me. And at that point, they were exposed. And many of his disciples left him. And he turned to the twelve and gave them a chance. Are you also going to leave? But this one, they had found something. They found a pathway. They saw that, no, this is the way to eternity with God. I said, where are we going to go? You are the one with the word of life. You are the one with the pathway to eternal life. Because sometimes when we study and we read some of these things, we think that these things are, they are not, we are living that system. No, no, no. We are, Babylon is running this earth. Babylon is the operating system that is running this earth. 
And so if you don't let God continue to take his place and give him what is due to him, you will be shocked when Babylon will take it all. Babylon will take it all. So we are in a season when people will be driven by the extremes of life. For some people, it will be comfort. It will be comfort. Some people, is the opposite of comfort. Hardship. For some people, it's hardship. That's another extreme of life. For some people, joy. Extreme. Joy. Not the normal joy. But that whole excitement about life. Opportunities are opening up to me. Now I'm earning in dollars. I'm not the local champion. You people are seeing earning in Naira. And then you see them living large. Showing to the world that they are better off than everybody else. What is that? Comfort. The excitement of earning more than the people around. And then that will then drive them off. In Yoruba, there's this adage that if your yam farm produce the biggest tuba of yam, what do you do? When you are eating it, you cover your mouth. You don't say to the world that my yam is big. Come and see. No, you cover, you cover, you cover, you, you, you cover. <laughs> Why in the world right now? Everybody just wants to show that I'm better than you. I drive a better car. I live in a better house. You see those poses and those pictures online. It's so worse that some people will borrow pose. You can imagine when they have their own, what they will do. That's the world that we live in today. Some people, it's extreme sadness because of certain things that will hit them. That's why I say, see, in this, for us, we must be able to manage loss. That's why the Bible says, you see, you better know how you mourn. Don't mourn like people who don't have hope. It's in the Bible. Google it. Because sometimes people suffer loss and they just, that's the end. And God said, no, don't mourn like those who don't have hope. It doesn't matter what you have lost in time. You have hope. You must keep hope alive. Because the moment you enter that dimension, you know what you just did? You're, you are, you are telling God God is unfaithful, kind. You're telling that God is unreasonable. You're telling God don't care. And, and that's what you're saying. That's what you're saying. Sadness. Extreme. Some people is wealth. Some people poverty. Some people difficulties. Some people ease. Ease will become the problem of some people because everything is easy for them. That will become their abattress. And so we must be careful of these extremes. Be careful of these extremes. Both extremes, either positive or negative, can drive us off the pathway. Because there are people who, because they've been very, they've lived such a tough life on this side of the world, by the time they leave and things turn a new leaf, they just become king and God to themselves. At that point, they no longer pray to God as they pray. They will no longer, you know, it's no longer, God is no longer needed. But we must build our lives that it doesn't matter. The conditions we find ourselves will stand for God. It doesn't matter the conditions. It doesn't matter the conditions. It doesn't matter the attainment. It doesn't matter the achievement. You stand for God. You are still that same humble you. Loving God. Giving God his place. Letting God reflect and giving him glory in the successes and in the achievement. Why do you think the West, they, they have no need for God in the West? Because everything works. Their God now is what? Is their government. Because the government stabilizes the system. But we must watch it. We must be established. We are the church of the last days. We are God's joker. Heaven is counting on us. So we must remain firm in God. And I want to say this, that for some of us, the risk is not even about abandoning the faith like some are doing. But the risk of becoming lukewarm or cold. Because some of us might sit here and tell ourselves that, oh, no, I can't back. I can't back. It is God. I know God. I have experience. I not. But some of us run the risk of becoming lukewarm or cold. And the moment you become lukewarm, from lukewarmness to coldness. And God warned in Revelation that at the level of lukewarmness, even before you become cold, I'm going to do what? Spew you out of my mouth. And so... God expects us to be on fire for him. And for us to remain on fire for him, you, we must be established. We must be established. We must be deep-rooted on this path. That was what Jesus did with the eleven. And he left and gave the gospel to them. And here we are today. The gospel has pro prospered for thousands of years, even in the face of tribulation and opposition, because they were established. They were not flaky. They were not moin moin believers. They were not instant no do's believers. That's what God is calling us into right now. To be established. One of our assignments 
And as part of our prophetic destiny is to facilitate the closing of this age. Is to facilitate the closing of this age. And I need us to hold on to that. Many have gone ahead of us. Generations have passed in time. But there will be a people on earth that will close this age. There will be a generation on earth that will facilitate the shutting down of time. And we are part of that generation. You are part of that generation. You have been called and ordained to be part of that generation. And you need to be aware of your assignment. Part of your assignment is to shut down time. It's to shut down time. Let me read very quickly because of time. 2 Peter chapter 30 from verse 1. There are some truths there I want to just extract very quickly. And so if you're here and you are confused and you don't know what you're living for, I want to say to you today that part of why you are here is to shut down time. It's to shut down time. So close this age. I'm going to be speaking more into that. But let, let, let's unpack some truth in this chapter. Chapter 3 of 2 Peter. Because I've said it before, one of the things we, 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 God will continue to lead us to do is to keep going to those portions of the scripture that speak to our time. Hallelujah. Remember I've said it, that context shapes everything. If you're in winter, you don't wear light clothes. You can't live in the UK, Europe, or Canada, or the Americas, and it's winter, and you're, and you're wearing what you're wearing right now. You will freeze. Why? The context is shaping what you wear. The season is shaping what you wear. And so the same principle applies in God. That seasons determines our emphasis. When the season of the end, our emphasis is not how people can be comfortable here in time. It doesn't mean that God will not take care of you. It doesn't mean that you won't work in miraculous provisions. Those ones are your inheritance, panoma, panoma. It's not debatable. All you need to do to activate those just to have sense. You will activate those. In, those, those are your inheritance in him. But if you now make that the emphasis and what you camp around day in, day out, then it's like wearing light clothes. In winter. Reading from verse 1, Peter said, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days. Walking according to their own lust. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And do you know where these coffers are? These coffers are not from outside. They're actually from within. So in other words, the people that will make you believe that the return of Jesus Christ is still far will come from the church. Because these people recognize, they say, since the fathers, in other words, they recognize that our fathers actually had this conversation. Separate them, please. So these people are not from outside. They are going to come from inside and make you feel comfortable and make you feel as though the coming of Jesus Christ is still a distant reality. And they, they will use the word occupy wrongly. Yes, we are to occupy, but in a state of preparedness. If you occupy, and you're not getting ready for his return. That's a misoccupation. That's a misoccupation. So our occupation now, when we say occupy, must be in a state of readiness. Facilitating his return. It is not in a state of just sitting down and lounging. And say, the Bible says we should occupy till he comes. He said, they will come and say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And Peter said, for these, they willfully forget. Willfully forget. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old. And the earth standing out of water and in the water. By which the world that then existed perished. Being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. They forget that once upon a time, God wiped off everybody in the earth. They forget that God can shut down time. Verse 8 says, but beloved, do not forget this one thing. That with the Lord, one day is a thousand years. And a thousand years as one day. 
The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I began to appreciate this picture, this particular passage of the scripture when God was just talking to me about destruction and, you know, eternity without him and how wretched it is and it will be to live in eternity without God. When I reflected on that, I was like, oh God, that's why you are patient. That's why you are giving us second chances. He doesn't want anybody to experience that life without him. Verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. So he, after talking about and establishing the fact that God is patient, God does not want anybody to perish. God wants everybody to come to repentance. There's a but. And when you read, read, and then you see a but, that whatever follows the but will counter, will, will shake what preceded a little bit. But that he is patient, that he does not want anybody to perish, that he's waiting on everybody to be saved, does not mean it will continue forever. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will met with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? What manner of person ought you to be? You are supposed to be living in holiness and godliness. You're supposed to be living holy and godly lives. So in other words, time of the end, type of life. In other words, as we was talking about the end, everything come to an end, there was also a kind of life that ought to match that season. And if indeed context shapes everything, and determines everything. That means as we come to the last days, we are supposed to live holy and godly. So the emphasis today is to get believers to live holy and godly. Because context determines the emphasis. Verse 12 is very important, which describes our assignment. It says, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Looking for and doing what? Hastening. In other words, fast track, facilitate the coming of the day of God. You know, that's why I say part of our assignment here is to facilitate the closing of this age. So you have to be looking forward to. And then you have to hasten the coming of that day. You have to look forward to and to hasten the coming of that day. And so part of the prophetic destiny of the last day church is to look forward to and to hasten the coming of Jesus Christ. That's part of our prophetic destiny as the last day church. And you can't say you are a last day church and not be looking forward to and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. This is part of our assignment. This is our prophetic destiny. We must have this clear picture and understanding that you are here not just to get by, that you are here not just to survive, that you are here not just to live life and wait for Christ to come, but that you are here to facilitate the coming of the day of the Lord, to hasten it, to quicken it, to make it come fast. Because God is not going to do everything by himself, even though he can do everything by himself. There are certain things that God has said, no, I'm going to continue to work with man. From the beginning, he demonstrated it. When after creating all the animals and then he called Adam, come on, finish the work. The same way in the midst of the last days, God will not just shut down time all by himself. He's going to do that in partnership with the last day church. So this is part of our prophetic destiny. This is part of why we are still here. We have to hasten the coming of the day of the God. And he said, because of which the heavens will be dissolved being on fire, and the element will melt with fervent heat. And he said, nevertheless, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Righteousness. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what God is asking us to facilitate. Who does not want to live in a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells? 
when you walk around, you see injustice. You see the, the, the strong taking advantage of the weak. You, you, you see people in power taking advantage of people who are not in power. You see the imbalance, the inequality, the oppression. I mean, come on, that is not what God wants. And if you don't want that because you, you have the nature of God, then what we need to do is to facilitate the coming of a new heaven and a new earth where only righteous dwells. That is part of our assignment. Verse 14 says, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found in him in peace. Hey, hallelujah. He said what? Be diligent to be found in him. Be established. Firmly established in him. Firmly established. Because that's why I'm saying one of the objectives of this, the learning outcomes of this series is to be firmly established. So be firmly established. Because there will be storms that want to derail you. Because there will be things that want to discourage you. Because things will come at you to take you off the path. But you have to be firmly. You have to be diligent to be found by him in peace. Without what? Without spot. And what? I'm blameless. Today, people justify certain things. They say, eh, eh, I don't do this. I don't. This is the only one I have. Was, if you are here, be sincere. If you're one of those of us that say, okay, I, I don't womanize, I don't, um, I don't smoke, I don't drink, uh, but, but this is the only one. And God knows I've tried. No, that's, that won't do it. Oh. It won't do it. Oh. It won't do it. He said, with what? What with what? He said, with, without what? Without spot. And what? Blameless. That is perfection. That's wholeness completeness. So right now you can't be in God and as a member of the last day church and because of certain boxes and then you now say this is the only one. Because we have a lot of that in the church today. Today. We have a lot of people who say oh, because I don't do this, because I pray, because I do this, eh, but this women thing. My only and God understands that this is the only one I have. This only one that you have is going to lead you to hell. This only one that you have is going to negate the 99%. This only one. And we are not saying this enough in church. We are not saying this enough in church. And it breaks my heart. And then people don't know that there is grace. See that one thing, that one vice. The grace of God that helped you conquer the other 99 can still help you conquer that one. But because we don't say it, we don't get to release the grace. Because we don't teach holiness. We don't get to release the grace that can make people live holy. Because we don't teach purity. We don't get to release the grace that can make people live pure. But rather we teach favor. And the people are finding favor. And they will be favored and be favored and be favored and end up in hell. We tell them about the goodness of God and how much he wants us to prosper. And the people will live in prosperity and they will be prosperous. There will be so much prosperity. And we end up in hell. Because what really matters, we have relegated to the background. This message has become what people hear once in a while. The message you should be hearing every day. Sometimes people hear, they come around TF Church and they come and say, ah, wow, thank God. At least, ah, it's good to be hearing this message once in a while. I'm like, in my, I won't tell them. I will, I will pretend. I will just nod. And I'm like, no, you don't hear this message once in a while. You should not be hearing it once in a while. Say, ah, this message was meant for me. Ah, thank God I came here today. Ah, I should be hearing this once in a while. Eh? This message once in a while. This is not a message you hear once in a while. This is the gospel of the kingdom. The disciples, Jesus Christ didn't come with any other gospel. It was when Jesus, John the Baptist came, when Jesus Christ came, it was all, repent for the kingdom of God is what? Is at hand. That's why the disciples, they lived as though the kingdom will come to them the next day. Then what happened to us? God opened our eyes to other portions of the Bible. We now can see what those portions can do in time. How those promises can make us become big and comfortable. Then we tabernacle there and we neglect the most important thing. So this is not a message you hear once in a while. Because this is about your eternal life. To be found in him in peace without spot or bl and blameless. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. As also our beloved brother Paul according to wisdom, the wisdom given to him. I jumped to verse 17 and he said, you therefore beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware Hallelujah. He said what? Beware. In other words, be careful. Take heed. Lest you also fall from your own steadfastness. 
So in other words, it is possible to fall from your own steadfastness. That's what I was saying. That before you know, you become lukewarm. From lukewarmness, you become cold. And then gradually, the system tells you, come on, you need me, not God. The system tells you, serve me. I will take care of you, not God. That's why some of those people say, no, I, this government is my God. And then people on fire here, they go there and they worship that system. They worship that system. Anything about God will just fade out. No more caring. No more because it demands your time, your time, your time. Every bit of hour that you can squeeze in to get extra bucks. And the system is designed so perfectly that before you know, 40% of whatever you earn is tax. And it tells you you have to do more, do more, do more, do more. It's a deception. It's a deception. That's why you don't jack by if God has not sent you. Just what I'm saying. Anybody, you are leaving here to Europe to study, to do anything, or to live, or to relocate. Make sure God sends you. Make sure you are sent. Because it can be a trap. Make sure you are sent. Because a lot of people on fire here have gone to those systems. And then before you know, the system became their God. And the God that which I mean, if you don't worship this golden calf, man. <laughs> Hungry, go why are you? You're not gonna see money sent home. Oh. This is your God God thing. <laughs> I just laugh. And then after a while, you two I'll be where the golden calf day. <laughs> do that. That's what people do. That's what people are doing. They, they have no clue that they are worshiping a system. Because that system keeps them alive. And they abandon God. That must not be you. That must not be you. That must not be you. That's why God is emphasizing this right now. Be firmly established. The family established. Beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, from your own fervency, from your own fire. Beware. Beware. And he said, being led away with the error of the wicked. And he said, but grow in the grace and a, a knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Instead of that, you should do what? You should grow. Instead of that, you should do what? You should advance. That's why. Please. You go to a place and then you realize that your spiritual life is beginning to come down. Please. Check out of that place and of that system. Because you want to know. It's gradually the things of God. Your taste will begin to change. Your appetite for the things of God will begin to just change. And then you can say, well, at least I'm not committing fornication. I'm not going, ah. You won't know. It's very subtle. So this is not only for those who may have to travel or relocate. This is also for us here. Let's firmly be planted. Beware. Be steadfast. Even while you are here. Because even those of us who are here, even the system here tells you more time you give it. Give it more time. Give it more time. The few hours you need to spend with God, to pray in the morning, to commune with your father, to study. Ba Babylon takes it. You can't spend quality time with God. The few hours you're supposed to gather and congregate with your brothers, Babylon takes it because you need to worship the system to keep afloat. Be steadfast. This is the message of God to us in this season. And there's a reason God, God is emphasizing this to us. And these six or seven objectives that we are tracking in this season. I want to encourage you. You get back. Listen to the message again. Take your notes. You see, all of those objectives, pray into them on your own. Don't only engage when we gather. Engage on your own. Don't make your engagement with God just be about our corporate gathering. The corporate gathering is to steer you up and activate you. But what you do outside of this place, God is also looking. Engage with these things. Let's bow our heads and pray into this. And just talk to God. Talk to God. God has brought his word to us today. Talk to him. It is mercy that has found you. It is mercy that has found us. It is mercy that has found me. It is mercy that has found me. And it is grace that has planted us on this path. But we must grow in this grace. We, mu we must grow in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And growing in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ means becoming like him. Because knowledge speaks of intimacy. Intimacy produces oneness. So growing in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ is not about head knowledge. It's not about a body of information that you have. It's not about knowing scriptures and who did what, who did what. That is not what it's about. 
It's about intimacy. It's about oneness. It's about becoming like him. It's about becoming like him. You can have a lot of scriptures in your head and yet not become like him. Father, we receive this word in thanksgiving. We receive the grace that has been released, Father. Because grace has been released tonight. 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 Grace for steadfastness has been released tonight. You are firmly established on the path of truth. You are firmly established on the path of truth. It doesn't matter what comes. You will not be driven by extremes of life. You will not be driven by extremes of life. You will not be driven by extremes of life. Grace has been released. Grace has been released. Grace has been released. Grace has been released. Has been released to remain on fire for God. To not become lukewarm. To not become cold. To not serve Babylon. Grace has been released. Father, thank you. We give you praise, God. Thank you for your mercy. And thank you for your grace. Your grace that keeps us on this path. Your grace that establishes that is establishing us on this path. Oh, Father, we thank you. Oh, we thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. Ah, Father, we have taken your word. We have received it and we will continue to receive it. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Amen.